Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, considering all of the challenges that are articulated in public discussion these days, there is still much more going for our region than against. Welcome again to the most widely watched source for Carolina business and public policy. I'm Chris William, and this time four municipal chief operating officers from Greensboro, Columbia, Charlotte, and Myrtle Beach. The oft underappreciated role of city manager is the connecting tissue, so to speak, between social services, public budgets and policy, strained political relations and commercial activity. How do they perceive and manage into this controversy? We begin in just a moment. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded October 11th, 2013. On this week's program, City Managers, Ron Carley from Charlotte, Tom Leaf of Myrtle Beach, Denise Turner-Roth of Greensboro, and Teresa Wilson of Columbia. Now, here's Chris William. Hello, welcome to our program, and as always, the good stuff happens off camera, so I'm going to ask you all to repeat exactly what we were talking about at the beginning. No, you know, let's start with something, because so often the city manager is one of those positions in an organization that is, in, and, I'm, and I'm pro I promise I'm not, I'm not playing to my audience here, but is an unsung position. Things work smoothly because you have your, your hands on the tiller, if, if you will. So, uh, Teresa, let me start with you. How, what do you think is the most misunderstood part about the city manager's slot? I think probably what you just said. I mean, I would consider, you know, as I'm amongst kindred spirits here today <laughs> talking that we're probably the worker bees. You know, I personally have been with municipal government for eight years, but manager, you know, less than a year assistant city manager beforehand and a lot of you know what I've been doing is managing and trying to help implement the policy that the elected officials mm -hmm. might set but what you find is that you often help have to help steer um, provide recommendations that they may or may not ultimately go with but doing um, your due diligence um, when you and taking into effect regulatory concerns citizen perception, citizen needs, um, and trying to help the policymakers balance what the, the vision might be, the mm -hmm. strategic goals of the city. Um, and I think often, you know, I guess it's un unsung and you're in the background and you're okay with that because, you know, I feel like in our role, it is meant for us to do that work so that the city and the policymakers shine so that our citizens are proud of um, the, the decisions that have been mm -hmm. made on their behalf. D Denise, anything strike a chord with you on that? I, I would add to that um, how invested we are personally in mm -hmm. the success of the community. I mean, I think it's sort of a... Yeah, a, what do you mean by that? Well, it, that our goal and our aim is for whatever vision there is from the, from the community for itself, as well as for council as an elected leader, as well as uh, us who are professionals who are who are working as a part of this organization in this city, how committed we are personally and how much it matters to us that the city is successful. I think that um, at times we're seen as just having a job uh, when in fact it is a, a lifetime change. And when I was appointed to the role, I said that you're getting a family in service. My husband and son were there with me. And in fact, it is just that um, we are 
constantly focused on how is our community developed and that is from a collective perspective of me and my family and not just as a job that I go in and do every day and then go home and move away from. You, you know, Ron, t let, me t let me take this in a different way, Tom, Ron. Here, so w we've, we've heard this. So you are at the intersection of politics mm -hmm. and, and running a business. I know you yeah. all know that. Right. I'm not yeah. telling you anything. So, and it is a business. Yeah. So, yeah. That's oh. lost a lot. So yeah. talk about this municipal state government intergovernment relations problem that we've not all of a sudden run into but seemingly has become more acute the, the, you know the we've, we've had for a number of years the state you need to talk about unfunded mandates passing unfunded mandates what's more I think important uh, critically important is that for us is that states now seem to want to get into our business they don't want to just make us do stuff they want to tell us how to do it and they spend an awful lot of time passing laws or debating laws that really get into the nuts and bolts of the service delivery. And that really is frightening. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be a lot worse on us than unfunded mandates and whatever else that the politicians uh, you know, argue about day to day. Mm -hmm. where, where did that start? Did that start with the Republican control for the first time in 100 years? Well, no, it's been going on uh, forever. I think what's particularly problematic right now is the high level of partisanship at both the state and the federal level. And government's really not working very well there. And that's true for a lot of cities that operate under that same political model. Going back to your first question, the, ma the council manager form of government was created a century ago in order to bring a business model as opposed to a political model to the business of running the services that people depend on day in and day out. And that is our job is to bring ethics and professional competence in support of the elected officials that represent the policy interest of uh, the people of the community. So, so Ron, how do you, and it certainly worked that way in Charlotte, worked, worked that way in all of your communities for a long time in Columbia. There's a referendum, as you very well know, Teresa, that's on the ballot for December 3rd, and it will decide if there will be a strong mayor or a strong city manager for the sure. first time in a long time. So uh, I guess the question here is how do you, do you think most people understand the difference here between having a mayor who's driving policy and direction and operations is having a manager? Sure. I don't. I think that certainly the people ought to be able to make that decision, though, once informed and educated. I think where we are right now specifically is that there's been a, a, a pretty, probably a brief period of time for that education to occur. So that is, you know, of some concern. Mm -hmm. But once educated, um, I think what the people have to understand are the implications for that. I mean, you can have a strong mayor without having a strong mayor form of government. It actually works quite well. We've all been talking about in our own experiences, including mine, it's worked very well to have a manager, um, a, a professional practitioner of how to manage a city who's working with a strong visionary leader and a mayor and that council. Um, however, to actually change the form of government, you then get into um, the legislative authority still residing with um, the mayor, who then also becomes the chief operating officer with the powers that the manager now has to hire and fire and, um, mm -hmm. you know, make all of those other type decisions where most of us, I think, sitting around this table, we're fairly objective. We are objective. Mm -hmm. We have to be mm -hmm. in the decisions that we make, practical, objective, um, taking on, as we've said, the policy implications that have been given to us, the strategic plan and priorities, and finding a way to uh, implement mm -hmm. without any strings attached, mm -hmm. so to speak. I think people are presented with a false dichotomy. I mean, would you say Mayor McCrory was weak or that Mayor Fox was weak in sure. Charlotte? I don't think so. You can have really strong and visionary leaders providing that policy and political direction, and you need strong political direction, particularly in larger cities, but then you need that, that continuity and, and the ethics and the professionalism that the business community in particular can depend on to be there and be enduring year in and year out, and that's what professional managers do. So, yeah. go ahead, were you uh, gonna say something? Just to play off of that, they, let's, let's flip it around. Let's talk about in, in the business world where you have a CEO, which the city manager is the CEO, yeah, sure. and you have a, a chairman of the board, 
are the folks that are pushing the strong mayor form of government, are they saying that in the business world the CEO is ineffective, is not, mm -hmm. is, is, it, you know, cannot run the city, not run the, run the business? I mean, no. The CEO and the chairman of the board and the board work together to carry out whatever vision and policies of the corporation mm -hmm. or the city. And so it, it doesn't take a, you know, a strong mayor or to solve all the problems. And that's one of the problems in Columbia, I think. If you read the paper, mm -hmm. the paper thinks that, okay, we get a strong mayor, all of oh, our problems go away. It is not a panacea. And it is no, not no, a panacea. Not, yeah. not at all. I worked in Washington, D.C. for the mayor there, which is a strong mayor form of government, and it's it, 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 it toned be primarily because it is an elected leader. So depending on who's in leadership, that role can look very differently. Um, I worked for Anthony Williams, who had a background in business and had come out of uh, federal government um, with uh, GAO, and so he actually was very attuned to serving as a CEO and did that role well and very strongly. We can look at the history of D.C. of how that has mm -hmm. worked and hasn't worked at times, and I think that's a prime example of where the challenges come in if mm -hmm. you have an elected individual who's also leading the city government and uh, has a responsibility of both the purse strings as well as mm -hmm. the personnel requirements. Uh, let's shift gears here just a little bit, and let's, uh, uh, and let's stay with you, Denise. Um, what are your legislative priorities next year? What would you like to get done? And I ask that in, in, in reflection of the, what we just talked about, municipal and state intergovernmental relations, not being at a high watermark, for sure. Well, and what I was going to say to that is that where we can work best together between the state and the, lo uh, the local municipalities is when we are looking at ourselves as a collective goal. In North Carolina, we have certainly sustained quite a bit of job loss, and we're trying to get our place back in terms of what is going to be our industry base and where are we going next as a state, trying to attract businesses here, um, both from a uh, advanced manufacturing and otherwise. And so that's where our focus will be uh, going into next year, is how can we take advantage of the resources that we do have as a city and as a region and leverage that with the support of the state. So we've been talking about um, automobile manufacturers, mm -hmm. for example, coming to the state. You know, that could be a very huge investment for us as a state and a huge gamble, but um, a strategic gamble can be the right one. Um, so I would like to see us working in partnership with the state on how we deal with the major issue that's facing all of us. If we don't get our revenues up where we're talking about uh, you keep my revenue, I keep, uh, you know, or I keep Zero it, sum game. You know, yeah. it, we're not yeah. going to get to where we need to be. Yeah. Uh, let's go around the table. What are legislative priorities for Charlotte? I, I certainly agree with Denise. This fighting between state and local is not helpful. We spent so much energy in the Charlotte perspective around the airport uh, this past session. That was not a helpful discussion. Uh, I think we need to build relationships and really work on things that we have in common that improve the economy of the cities as well as the state. There's a symbiotic relationship there. Our interest in the end should not be in conflict. They should be tightly aligned. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. One of the things, you know, my former life doing governmental affairs, so lobbying efforts for our state and federal issues um, in the city of Columbia, but working very closely with our legislative delegation, the state level and federal, um, but the relationship building really is key because what I often I think was somewhat successful with in getting our state level legislators to understand that our council members, their constituencies are, are the same. Mm -hmm. So that means these quality of life issues, economic development issues that maybe a city council member's constituent is facing is the same that your constituency is Isn't facing. that easier to so, do in a capital city like Columbia though? Because it, you are so sure. closely, mm -hmm. physically close to each sure. other. You would think, but I think it's, uh, you, would think, you would think and hope that, I think it's always a, a work in progress though. You can't, um, you know, only go over to the state house when you need something. You have to build relationships all along and you have to find those commonalities um, and, and, and advocate all year long, not just when mm -hmm. it's a, 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 some major issue going on. And that's, that's something that I hope to continue, you know, with our council and our, and our legislators as well. Code enforcement, for example, mm -hmm. is an issue where the quality of life when you have uh, absentee landlords, so to speak, and then we're left within the munis municipal arena dealing with those things. Well, you have to then work with the county. It may have to be a lien on the property tax bill. You've got to work with the state to help us put some tools in our toolbox where we can address those type of issues. So I know that's a, a major concern for City of Columbia. Mm -hmm. And then also being thankful for some of the things that state legislature has passed as far as an abandoned, build, abandoned buildings uh, legislation mm -hmm. that provides some tax incentives. 
um, investment opportunities for people who are willing to take on uh, revitalizing historic properties and such. So I think you find the wins mm -hmm. and you utilize that to say thank you, but let's kind of keep pushing mm -hmm. forward with some of these economic development mm -hmm. tools that municipalities can really benefit from. Tom, what do you got? Um, we're not going to be asking the legislature for anything this year. We were able to get a one penny sales tax for tourism promotion about two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we don't plan to go back and ask for anything. I think we're really more on a defensive mode right now. There's, you know, there's always talk about fixing the property tax and fixing business mm -hmm. license and strike and those, fears on the heart of oh, managers. It's, it's yes. those things. And so <laughs> we're going to be having to guard ourselves against those fixes. But in terms of a priority of going to them and asking for certain things, this year we're going to stay back. When, when, when you all retreat back into your offices and start to think strategically, one of those strategic uh, silos, if you will, has got to be community investment. I know it's a big one. So when times are tough, when you're coming out of 08, we've got, uh, you know, we're past the Great Recession, but, you know, some people argue we've got a political depression going on. <laughs> How do you argue capital investment? And, and specifically in a town like Greensboro, when you're trying to flesh out the center city, when you're trying to get a performing arts center going, how do you make the case, if you, if you don't mind, Denise, how do you make the case for capital investment when folks are already fatigued by budgets and funding and all of those things? It, and we have done that quite a bit this year um, over the past two years, in fact. Um, when we've talked about our capital investment, we've, we've had to be very focused on sharing, bringing everyone into that conversation and helping to there to be a collective understanding that the vision is for a collective good. You know, it's not just downtown, which might be in one council member's district, but downtown being the heart of our city and being a important part of our collective growth. Do you think they hear that and they understand it really in their DNA? Uh, it's, it's a work in progress. I, I couldn't sit here and say that everyone embraces that vision and idea, but I can say that uh, it, from a public fundraising perspective, we've been able to be very successful at getting $35 million in commitments from the private sector. Um, in that we have had a grassroots effort of 70 plus people who served on a task force to say that we want the Performing Arts Center and this is what we want it to look like. Um, and we have other efforts that are going into play. Our Performing Arts Center um, is actually going to be a location for us to have our uh, neighborhood events as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's replacing our War Memorial Auditorium, mm -hmm. which has been the place where you go for graduations, uh, as well as other school events and uh, different type of concerts, from gospel concerts to country concerts. So it's going to be a place for everyone, and that's an important sell as well. Well, and, and in a town like Charlotte, Ron, when your predecessor arguably made the decision to retire, he floated a $900 million, almost a billion dollar mm -hmm. community investment project mm -hmm that seemed to be going and, and certainly seemed to have the votes and then fell apart at the last moment. So, how, I mean, how do you cobble together these yeah. ideas? But then it was put back together and approved this year. Uh, and so we're about to pump out over $800 million over the next several years into the, pro into the economy, mostly the private sector and capital investment. And building on what Denise said, uh, I think part of the argument is also return on investment. Mm -hmm. The, the, this is not spending money on capital projects just to spend money on them. They're done to leverage private investment back into the uh, community to create jobs, to add value, and really uh, ensure our long-term economic sustainability. And I think on all of our capital projects, given the tight times in which we live, and, and in Charlotte's case, uh, the city council actually approved a modest increase mm -hmm. in the property tax to fund this program, We've got to show the taxpayers a return on the use of their money. And that's something we're going to watch very closely. I think what Charlotte did You mean was the, very, the, the talk about property tax increase? Well, the property tax increase, but they, they did it with a very clear focus of this is what these funds will go for, and this is the expected return on that effort. And so I, I think it was important for the public to understand that Charlotte had a vision, that the leadership had a direction it was going in, and that it was going to follow through with, through that, with that commitment. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting to watch that. I think you also have to sometimes help the, the citizenry understand to the benefit of oftentimes focusing in one area. But the idea with a downtown, for example, and, and ours is very similar, in that this mayor, Mayor Benjamin, and council have put that effort perhaps in the downtown core, but the idea is almost like uh, the spindles in a bike, is that you start in your core, but it's got to, it, you know, that energy and synergy has to also um, flow out to the surrounding mm -hmm. areas and the other districts in Columbia. And that's the idea with the leveraging of funding, um, not just uh, 
local government funds, but federal funds. We well, use our CDBG dollars, for example, in Columbia to leverage $6.1 million of private investment right. in the so, downtown. <laughs> but but do facade grants with, you know, mm -hmm. community-based focused um, federal dollars. And how much of a challenge, especially in Columbia, is it, Teresa, that you have still, you have Richland County, you have Lexington County, and you have two different forms of government, but still have a commonality. Sure. I think oftentimes it's, it's um, you know, the stars aligning at the right time. The, the county administrator, uh, Tony McDonald in Richland County, and I really started our roles around the same mm -hmm. time. We tend to have a very similar um, philosophy of govern of governance we work very well together and sometimes that type of back to the relationship building you would hope that the councils also play well in the sandbox together but as the management going back to the benefit of having administrators and managers you sometimes have to help lead through mm -hmm. that and and work with our staffs um, we were talking last week because the citizen doesn't know who owns a particular mm -hmm. road so you know you have your staffs and you're well it's a richland county no it's a columbia road you're no, it's all, a state road you're all smiling like, like this is and we tony and i are like no 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 uh the citizen doesn't care about any of that we got to figure this out but you can tell the, the difference in color of pavement when you cross over <laughs> one county or another the tom i, I want to come to you and especially very unique situation community in the grand strand you've yes. got uh, and, I, and I know this, uh, that the, not just Myrtle Beach, but the, the Grand Strand's been trying to get some respect and love from the State House for a long time, just around tourism. So how do you, how do you sell yourself to the State House in Columbia? And how do you get the support that you need? And how do you sell yourself to constituents that are in, in your own hometown? You're right. We, um, we are sort of the redhead, the stepchildren of South <laughs> Carolina. We send a lot of money to the state tax-wise, you know, $400 million of revenue from, to the state. Um, but we are many times viewed as a, a resort, a summertime resort. Uh, not, they don't take us seriously. You don't have the same problems that other urban areas may have. But, but I think the key to it is relationships, not going to them just when you need something from them. And the key also is that you, tell, you show them the return on investment. You know, we were able to get money from the state to um, buy property next to the convention center. And, we, and our whole case was a return on investment. If we, if we expand the convention center, this is what uh, the city and the state will make. Do you have to sell that to the broad community or just the legislators that are going to approve that both, sale? Both, but particularly the legislatures. So the Myrtle Beach, uh, most everybody in Myrtle Beach understands the game we're in, mm -hmm. that we are a tourism base. We were able to uh, build the uh, boardwalk um, during mm -hmm. really the height of the recession. But everybody understood, and particularly council understood, that you need to put that money, it's kind of like advertising when business is slow, you've got to put that money in the ground so that when the recession ends, folks will have something new to come to at the beach. This year we're uh, building the 100,000 square foot uh, indoor sports mm -hmm. space. That's an return on investment that we're showing, you know, maybe $6 million in direct spending first year, $25 million uh, after about five years. And so we're saying we're going to spend this money, but we're going to get this money in mm -hmm. return. Mm -hmm. we, we've got about a minute left. Are you all encouraged that we've hit a, and I say this from a positive standpoint, hit a low point in intergovernmental relations that it's, it, that it started to turn and it will be an easier dialogue between state mm -hmm. and municipality? And if you're thinking too hard about it, then that's probably no, not. I think, <laughs> I think it's a heavy lift going forward. Yeah. I think we have a lot of work to do. Yeah. It could get worse. I think part of it too, and something we've talked about quite a bit, is how do we help the legislators understand the value of cities and municipalities? And really, we should be a part of the big picture of these are the assets that we have to bring forward as a state in North Carolina. You know, the idea that we are competing internally is not a successful one. We are mm -hmm. competing on a, on a regional level, and we're competing as a country um, for jobs and, and for uh, what our next industry base is going to be. So whether we're at a low point or not, we, I think our job is to help understand the value of cities. Mm -hmm. We want to be friends. Yeah. yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, what did you say? We want to be friends with the, with the yeah. legislature. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, ladies, gentlemen, thank you for being on the program. You know, it's, this is just scratching the surface, getting insight in what you do. So thank you for your commitment and your role in leading and doing all those things. But we're glad to have you on the program. And we hope you'll come back Thanks, and get part two of this. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for watching our program. If you have any questions or comments, please go to carolinabusinessreview.org and, and make those. Until next week, I'm Chris Wedding. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com.